Hi, it's Katrina. My friend David is actually going to be helping me out today, so we can give you a little bit more variety. Everyone say hi! Number 10. The Beast of Revelation There are technically two beasts described in the Book of Revelation. The first emerges from the sea and is given great power by the evil dragon. He climbs from the dark abyss to wreak havoc on the world. And then the second beast comes directly out of the earth and actually works kind of like the assistant to the first beast, instructing the men of the world to worship it. One thing that's for certain is that the two beasts we are warned about in the Bible are in direct opposition to God. They are soldiers of the King of Darkness, great and awful monsters who will persecute the saints, influence the kings of the earth, and ready themselves for the great battle of Armageddon. But in the book of Revelation, the beasts don't end up being so tough. Both of them are defeated by Jesus and thrown into the lake of fire. Still, the book of Revelation says that before these beasts are slain, they will torment and influence mankind. The first beast, which rises from the sea, is a terrible thing to behold. It has seven heads and ten horns, and upon each horn is a crown. His name is Blasphemy, and he looks like a leopard mixed with a bear and a lion. The beast is so ugly that people won't be able to help but gawk at it in wonder and to follow it. The second beast, the one which comes from the earth and is called the false prophet, is the cleverer one. This is the one the Bible says will force all people to receive the mark of the beast upon their right hand or forehead, thus marking them before the day of judgment. Number 9. Nebuchadnezzar the Werewolf King Nebuchadnezzar II of Babylon, also known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great, was both a major player in the Bible and a real historical figure. He was the second man to rule the Neo-Babylonian Empire, starting at the death of his father in 605 BC until his own death in 562 BC. Historians regard him as the greatest king of all Babylonia, notorious for his successful military campaigns for the immense construction projects inside the capital of the city of Babylon, and for his impact on Jewish history. But he's also famous because of some obscure passages in the Bible which describe him as transforming into a wolf. The story is really complicated, but the simple version is that the great king of Babylonia got into some trouble with God for his boastfulness. In the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar refused to accept Daniel's God as his own, yet respected that he exists. But respect wasn't good enough for God, and he sent the king a nightmare. God said that if the king did not worship him as was intended, he would become a beast. And in the end, when Nebuchadnezzar refused to worship God, the curse was thrust upon him. The Bible says that his hair grew as long as eagle feathers, his nails became like talons, he ate grass like a cow, and he lived in the forest like a madman. This could very well be the first description of a werewolf transformation in history. There isn't any physical or archaeological evidence that this happened, only the passage in the Bible that claims the king turned into a snarling, hairy beast. Number 8. Biblical Vampires The most detailed description of a vampire can be found not in the Bible, but in the Sefer Chassidim. For those unaware of what this book is, it's an old text that was written by Judah ben Samuel describing the religious life of Jewish people in medieval Germany. The book discusses a creature called the Aluka, which was mentioned very briefly in Proverbs, which is in the Bible. In Proverbs, the Aluka is translated to English as horse leech, but biblical scholars say it can actually be translated to bloodlusting monster. The creature in Proverbs was described as having teeth like swords and could never be satisfied with water. The Sefer Chassidim goes into a little more detail. It describes the people of medieval Germany and how they believed in a biblical monster that could shapeshift into a wolf, fly using its own long hair, and only continue to live if it consistently drank human blood. Medieval Germans used to bury the people they thought were vampires with rocks or dirt stuffed in their mouth. That way they wouldn't turn into a demon once they reached hell. Number 7. Witches and Sorceresses If there's one thing the Bible warns us about, it's witches. There's nothing quite as vilified in the Bible as a woman with supernatural powers. Witches are mentioned so frequently, it's impossible to read the book and miss the point. The Bible explicitly condemns all types of spiritualism that don't directly relate to God. 
Any witch who contacts the spirits, any sorceress who thinks she can practice magic, and any medium trying to see into the future is labelled by the Bible a monster. Not only does the Bible condemn witchcraft and those who practice it, it condones murdering them. Exodus 22.18 says, Do not allow a sorceress to live. That's pretty straightforward. Then there's Leviticus 20.31 that says, A man or woman who is a medium or spiritist must be put to death. You are to stone them. The Bible literally wants people to take any woman who practices any kind of spirituality and throw rocks at them until they are dead. The most famous witch in the Bible is probably Queen Jezebel from the Old Testament. She was the wife of Ahab, king of Israel, and was infamously vain and narcissistic. She wanted only the finest things in life and convinced her husband to turn away from the one true God and worship the old gods of Mesopotamia, Baal and Asherah. She was also a sorceress who practiced magic. To punish Queen Jezebel, God made sure she was thrown out of a window, trampled by a horse, and then eaten by stray dogs. Number 6. Jesus the Ghost In the New Testament version of the Bible, there is virtually nothing said about ghosts or spirits from another dimension. But there is one reference in Matthew 14.26 to be exact, when the disciples of Jesus witnessed him walking on water and thought he was a ghost and cried out in fear. Clearly, people from 2,000 years ago believed ghosts walked among us. And then there's another passage in Luke, in which Jesus says to look at his hands and his feet, and to touch him and see. Since a ghost does not have flesh and bones, but he does, that means he is not a ghost. The old style of English isn't the clearest, but it seems that Jesus at no point denies the existence of ghosts. In the Bible, he simply claims that he's not a ghost, but he doesn't deny their existence, and that's really the key part. But then if we go back even further to the Old Testament, we can see the story of King Saul. The king was having some serious trouble with the Philistines, so he summoned the ghost of the prophet Samuel to help him. In the Old Testament, the spirit is described as coming up from the ground, and King Saul actually lies on the ground to better speak with the ghost through the dirt. The consensus here is that the Bible teaches there are indeed spirits. There are spirits just like there are angels and demons. But fortunately for everyone, the Bible doesn't say anything about hauntings. Number 5. The Fire-Breathing Leviathan In the Bible's book of Job, there is a long and obvious description of a fire-breathing dragon. Job is talking about a horrifying beast called Leviathan. He says that when it sneezes, it flashes light, its eyes are as red as the dawn, lightning leaps from its mouth, flames of fire flash from its tongue, and streams of smoke billow out from its nostrils like steam from a pot. Its breath is like kindled coals, and flames burst from its mouth. That's about as good of a description of a dragon as a person can make. The Leviathan is even described as having tremendous strength, as striking terror into the hearts of people wherever it goes, and having flesh so firm and hard it can't be penetrated. That sounds an awful lot like impenetrable dragon scales. But what purpose does this leviathan have? It's actually supposed to be a sea serpent, a demon connected to the deadly sin of envy. It's an embodiment of chaos, and it hungers for the souls of the damned. Some historians believe the great biblical dragon might have been inspired by the Canaanite monster called Lotan, which also happened to be a lot like a dragon. Number 4. The Locusts One of the nastiest monsters in the Bible is the locust, or rather a plague of locusts, but these are no ordinary insects. In the book of Revelation, after the fifth angel sounds his trumpet and a star falls from the sky to the earth, the abyss is opened and a calamity unlike any other befalls mankind. Smoke bursts from the abyss as if from a gigantic furnace, the sun and the sky are darkened, and a swarm of terrifying locusts descends upon the earth. These locusts are horrifying. They are described as both looking like scorpions and looking like horses prepared for battle. The locusts have hair like women's hair, and their teeth are as big as lion fangs. They wear breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings is like the thundering chariots going into battle. But they also have great big tails that can sting like scorpion tails, and each sting causes pain lasting up to five months. When these locusts come to humanity, it's all part of the apocalypse. They are given the order not to kill people, but to torture them beyond agony for approximately five months. In those months, men will be tormented so fiercely by the plague of locusts 
that they will seek death but will be unable to find it. Number 3. The Nephilim the Nephilim are supposedly the offspring of human women and male giants. These creatures are discussed in the book of Genesis, along with a lot of non-canonical writings. The issue with the Nephilim is that they are only touched on briefly in the official scripture. It's only in the non-canonical stuff that more detailed descriptions of these gigantic beasts and their parents can be found, and for that reason, interpretations vary dramatically from one religious group to the next. Some believe the Nephilim descended from Seth, Adam's third son, and some say they are descendants of Cain, Adam's first son. But by far the most intriguing theory is that the Nephilim were born of angels and the daughters of Adam and Eve. Because in Genesis, that's kind of what it says. The Bible says that when men began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of heaven took many of them as their own wives. The Nephilim were then born and they became heroes of old and men of renown. This is quite interesting because it seems to describe the Nephilim not as terrible beasts or ugly monsters, but as heroes. And yet, when you look at interpretations of this passage in the Bible, most people say the Nephilim were tainted offspring, as the angels were twisted by their lust for human women and fathered monstrosities. Then, after the Nephilim began to walk the earth, God was forced to flood it and thereby reset society to rid the world of the abominations. Number 2. The Four Horsemen The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse are some of the scariest creatures the Bible has to offer. These figures appear in the Book of Revelation and are described by John of Patmos as part of his vision of the end of the world. In Revelation, God's right hand holds a scroll sealed with seven seals. He gives this scroll to the Lamb of God, also known as Jesus Christ, and the seals are opened one by one. With the opening of each of the first four seals, one of the horsemen is loosed upon the planet. The first horseman comes in on a white horse and is interpreted as one of either three things. The white horseman is either Jesus Christ, the Antichrist, or pestilence. Nobody can seem to decide, but many scholars have stuck with pestilence since it fits in with the rest of the horsemen. So, the first horseman brings great sickness and disease to the world, and then the second horseman comes on his red horse with his great sword and plunges the world into conflict and strife. With nations at war and the people stricken by disease, the third horseman on his black horse comes to release famine. Now there's no food, and everybody's starving. Finally, the fourth horseman on his pale steed comes as death. He comes to kill a quarter of the humans not already dead, and he's accompanied by the Greek god Hades. Hades follows behind death on his pale horse, his mouth wide and swallowing the souls of all those taken by death. Number 1. The Behemoth the behemoth is described by Job as a great and terrible beast of unfathomable size and unparalleled strength. What's interesting is that in the Bible, Job seems to be familiar with the unstoppable and fearless creature. It's described as a plant eater, it lives near water, and it's rippling with muscles. None can hunt the behemoth, it can't be captured, and some believe it might be a dinosaur. It's important to mention that the behemoth from the Bible, along with the Leviathan, don't play any kind of significant role in the narrative. God simply points out the two mightiest creatures in the world to help Job remember his place as a small and insignificant human. We know the Leviathan is described as a dragon and the behemoth kind of as its land equivalent. And while historians say the behemoth was probably supposed to be either a hippopotamus or a rhinoceros, it may have instead been a dinosaur. Because Christians don't typically believe that dinosaurs existed millions of years ago, and instead were created by God near the same time that he created man, they believe dinos and humans coexisted. Many religious people think the behemoth was either a Diplodocus or an Apatosaurus. Which terrifying beast from the Bible freaks you out the most? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon for another awesome video.